Hey, so some of you have been emailing me and asking about what classes are currently available. So I wanted to give a quick rundown of that. I might not explain this entire sheet, but it's a video. You can pause it and read the whole thing. Most of the details are here. Uh, classes that are coming up really soon. I have an intro to combinatorics class that uses the AOPS intro to counting and probability textbook. It's on Wednesdays from 4.30 to 6 Pacific and will begin as soon as I'm done doing the number theory course. Uh, really quick word, they do not, I'm not part of AOPS or anything like that. But what I do is I use their textbooks to teach my classes and it's very thorough. We go through every single question in the text, either on your own or in the class or during the session. And any questions that are asked from all the students, they all get answered and it's interactive Zoom. I write on the screen with a stylus and I explain the question, but I'm not just explaining the question. I'm gonna give you an example of that in the video that's upcoming here in a moment where you're going to see the way that I teach a class as opposed to at the whiteboard. Um, because during the class, it's gonna be interactive. You get to interact with me and ask questions and we have discussion about what certain aspects of the problem might be like, what should we be thinking about at given times, how do we strategize problem solving in general, the reading of the question, how we process that reading, what are the clues that the item writers left behind? All of that is going to be gone into that is not going to come up on a written solution that you find online. Um, and it's not even just done on my videos because there's no chance to interact with the video. So I can't use Socratic method to teach in that way during the video because there's not a live audience to respond back. But you'll see that in this video coming up. It's kind of long. It is 20 minutes actually to explain this one question, but it's a really important question. There's lots of little nuggets of deep thinking and analysis and a response to problem stimulus that you're gonna see in the video, including coaching, um, mindset coaching. So I do encourage you to watch the whole thing. I'll try to later put timestamps where I feel like critical points are being made because I know that you all have short attention spans. <laughs> so uh, in, in this one here, feel free to screenshot this or look at it. You can send me a message through my website. The website will be in the description. Um, if you didn't know I had classes, yes, I do. No, they are not free. This is how I make my living. Um, and if you wanna take a class with me, I think you'll love it. Um, from all the students I've ever taught, I would say about 99% say it's the best class they ever had. There's maybe 1% that it's not a good match for, but send me a message, we'll discuss it. You can uh, sit in on a class and see what you think uh, before making a decision on that. Um, these PTR classes are past test review. So we're gonna be starting those at the last two weeks of May, right after APs finish. We spend one hour per test and review as many questions as we have time to answer in that time frame. Um, these classes, like I said, we starting up very soon. The AMC Fundamentals course, I use the volume one from AOPS text. There's currently a class for that right now that you could sit in on and see what you think um, and then make a decision on that. It'll be a two hour class when it starts for the summertime course, but it's currently 1.5 as school is still in session. There's also a current AMC 10 pass test review and AMC 12 pass test review, which is where this video you're about to watch comes from. So if you have any interest in any other textbook to be taught, one I really want to do right now is the geometry school level edition, but it's really quasi competition level. And I'm going to be using the book that I promote on my uh, page, which is the McDougal little orange geometry textbook. It's from like the 90s or late 80s or something like that. Phenomenal text. It will really give you an in-depth look at geometry better than any of the modern textbooks will. So send me a message if you're interested. You can do it through my website. There's also an email listed on my about page and uh, we'll go from there. With no further ado, let me know what you think of this explanation. Again, I apologize for the link that was a little longer than I would have liked, but nothing I can do about that. It's just the way the problem kind of unfolded and the explanation unfolded. Good to see you all. Have a great one. I will see you soon. This is a great question. In this year, it was actually question 25 on the AMC 10. And uh, there's really important insight into understanding proper thinking processes and, and things in the later questions on the test. In other words, number 18 was 25? 
Say again. Problem 100. 18 was 25. Yeah. Oh. Um, so there, we're going to have to rely on, you know, some observations that we have to capitalize on. We first have to make the observation, then ask, what does that mean? And how could I use that? Or why is that there? Why? It's a peculiar. You can think of it like a, a bunch of string all up in this knot. And there's various, you know, yarn or something. And there's various pieces of the yarn coming out. And you just grab one of them and you pull on it. And suddenly the whole thing unravels. That's exactly what will happen in this problem. Okay, so for k greater than zero, let ick which is I sub K. I just want to call it ick because it sounds fun. Uh, I sub K equal a one with some, apparently an unknown number of zeros. Okay, and this is K greater than zero. We don't know what we're doing. There are K zeros. Okay, so we got that. Let's make an example because I, what I like to advocate uh, between the one and the six, I like to advocate that you don't keep reading. If you read something weird, stop and make sense of that something weird before you move on, because you're going to need a proper understanding of it to digest what is said afterwards. Otherwise, it's just gibberish and you're just reading symbols off a page. Um, a lot of people, when they try to read, they think that reading is looking at and recognizing the symbols in front of them. For example, this is the symbols that indicate the word prime, and they pronounce it in their mind, perhaps they say prime in their mind, and they think that they're reading that's not actually reading. That's just recognizing the symbols and saying their pronunciation. Reading requires comprehension. It requires understanding what we're doing. And if we get to this point right here, and we, it's going to be hard to process it. So just so really quick, I, I have a small question. Sure. So uh, it says I of K equals uh, one zero repeating until six, uh, 64. But they don't use I of K anywhere else in the sentence. But N of K appears... They do use it, right? I don't, here, right? Oh, sorry. I didn't see that. That's fine. Um, yeah, they're going to explain N of K later, but we'll get to that in a minute. I don't want to process this yet because I want to make sense of what this means. So in other words, since K is greater than zero, I want to play what I think is one of the most important games on the entire test. And that's the game of what if. You just play what if. What if K is one? There you go. What if K is when it's natural, right? I mean, I don't think many people are like, oh, what if K is 19? You know, what? Like, why are you starting there? Start in a logical sequential process at the lowest possible level. And you might say that, uh, you know, it could K be a decimal, but in general, subscripts are not decimals. They're subscripts. I don't, I don't think it could be a decimal because you can't have a, right. a fraction number of zeros. It's like you can't have x sub 0 0.4 right this doesn't nobody ever notes that right and you're right a fractional number of zeros same problem okay but both both reasons together can justify that one is the best starting point so let's just say i sub one all right if if k is one in other words k is one here what do we get we get one zero okay so it'd be one zero six four okay that's not so bad let's do i sub two I sub two is two zeros, one zero zero. And you can get quicker, right? You start to pick up speed because you now fully understand what you're doing. And that's good enough for right now. We just wanted to kind of write a few out. We could then look at these, these ones we wrote out with our further analysis as we continue, okay? I'm not even gonna write something here because I don't, why write anything? It's just, you're gonna have to write what you already wrote. So, uh, you know, what they wrote in this problem. But this information is new. What have we just done? We've processed the first sentence. Okay, good enough. Now that with that processing, we now move on to the next part. I, as a teacher, advocate you constantly do Wait, that. So you're supposed to break down the problem, right? Yeah, you want to break down the meaning of what you're reading as you read it, not at the end. A lot right, usually of what I do is I read the whole problem. And then that's I what I'm answer. saying. That's exactly what I'm trying to advocate against. Right. And the reason that we do that as people, there's a lot of teachers who say you should. I disagree. At some point, you're reading mush. Your brain's gibberish. It's, well, I don't know what I'm doing. I just read a bunch of stuff. It's nonsense to me. I, that's why I don't advocate for that. Now, maybe if you're doing an SAT level problem where it's not going to get too crazy, then maybe, you know, for some, and actually for critical reading, I do think perhaps reading the whole passage or there are critical reading SAT teachers who will say, read the whole paragraph or passage before you 
know, because there might be some context in later paragraphs that answer a question about the earlier one. And maybe that's true in critical reading. But in math, I don't think it works that way. No. Um, let's continue. Uh, let N of K be the number of factors of two in the prime factorization of I sub K. Okay, so now what? Let's go back to our I sub Ks. Let's just go with this one right here and think about what would N, because it's K again, and K is just the subscript and we wrote K as one. So if I was to do N sub one or N of one, what that means is I want the factors of two in this. And initially just do it. It's low enough, right? You know, do your factor tree and you don't, right now we're not relying on observation. We're just doing stuff to see what happens and kind of, you know, what if, same kind of game. So you're going to get 250 and 16 is 266 and 2 and 133. Okay. And you can get 19 and 7, right? Um, 2 cubed times 133. Uh, you, oh, but you don't care about that. Nine, yeah, 19 times uh, 7, yeah. right? Right, yeah, but we don't want that because we only want factors of 2 and odd numbers yeah. don't have any factors of 2. Oh, yeah. So once you get to the point where you get an odd, we don't care how it factors. We're not doing a full prime factorization, but you're exactly correct. 19 and 7, good recognition of that. Um, but because we're only counting factors of two, uh, this is not, I shouldn't actually put this here. It's actually three is what this is. And it's three because it's two to the third times 133. Again, ignore whatever that is if it's odd. But what we want is how many factors of two. If I continued prime factoring, does changing that into 19 and seven affect the factors of two? It doesn't, so we don't care. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we've done that one, and maybe we start the next one too. And just to you know, just to show what it would look like if we did that, I'm um, at some point you're probably not going to want to continue this process. Let's just do one more for fun. One zero zero six four cut ten thousand and half, you get five thousand and thirty two. And I'm not I'm even write the twos. Like why write them? I know they're there. Just keep cutting in half till you can. So five thousand cut in half is two thousand five hundred. 2,500 and half of 32, which is 16 is this. Cut that in half, 1,250 plus eight, 1,258 literally. 629. So we cut in half, one, two, three, four. Then we know N of two is four. Now, as we're looking at this, it starts to get more prohibitively difficult. Should we try one more to see if it holds true that it's always going to be going up by one? You could, uh, but that might, that would be a good thing to do. But what I would probably do right now, if I was solving the problem live, is just pause. And now that we've made sense of what it says, now go back to read what we do. And then you may come back and do the I sub three as well at that point. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to go look at that and we're going to read the next part. Okay. So. It says, what is the maximum value? So already we can tell two is the biggest than one. But we can also see from the answers, understand what are these six, seven, eight, nine, ten? 10? Are they K values? No, they're N values. So we're not, they're not these numbers. So four would be a possible answer if it appeared in there because that's an N value when K is the value of two. Always make sure you're asking those kinds of questions as well. We don't get confused. This is not K is six. It's N is six when K takes on a value or N is seven or N is eight and so on. Like a Y value. Would it be like a good idea to skip to I sub eight right now and then try that out? No, because uh, again, we don't know that eight is, eight is, not, eight is not K. Eight is ostensibly an N value when K takes on a certain value. Just like this is, this is not K. This is N. This is K. So K oh, is wow. two, N is four. That's what I'm trying to get at. It's input output concept. Does that make sense? Yeah. So then I sub 10. Well, I don't, why would we even do that? We don't, none of these are K values. These are all, this is N, this is N, this is N. So I, I can't do N sub N or I sub N, can I? I don't know how to do that. Yeah. So as a result, don't jump to these at all. That That's a, okay. If we can't think of what I'm about to say, and you're stuck and you just don't know how to go any farther, there would be two paths that you would take ostensibly. One might be continue with this process for I sub three. And let's just say it did come out to be five. Great, okay. Now, if you did that, and I'm pretty sure it does, if you did that, are we just gonna guess it keeps going up one forever? Then wouldn't the answer be infinity, right? That doesn't even really make sense because the maximum value is 10 in the whole answer space. So it must be that it maxes out at some point. 
you could, one way you could get it by chance is just keep going. See what happens. Eventually, you'll probably get to one of whatever the max value is and you'll cease to get any more. You could do that, but you're going to get to a point where maybe you've got a bunch of zeros in here. And, you know, what is that cut in half? And then cut in half, it gets really crazy in there, right? And you're going to have, you can't use a calculator. So that's not going to be probably a beneficial course of action. But in the event, let's say there's five minutes left and you look down here and go, I can't get those. Okay, then do it. Take your time and run the five minutes all through 18. I don't have a problem with that. It's better than skipping, right? But what we still want to do right now is we haven't done any analysis about creative thinking. All we've done is manipulated based on their words to see what happens. That's great. That's a good starting point. Now we want to ask more challenging questions. Now we want to take observations. So big picture, what are they asking us to find when they ask this question? Not just that it's N, but specifically, what is it we're looking for in this problem? We're looking for N of K. Okay, but what does N of, go back to what N of K represents. It's the number of factors of two in the That's prime. That's it. Factors. So the answer that we're giving is a number of factors of two. That doesn't make sense. What do they mean number of factors? Because when you prime factorization it, there's no, there's not going to be any multiples of two. They're just going to be two itself. Yeah, that's what happens. That's what they want. That's why this is three, because there's three factors of two. Oh, okay. They want the exponent then. Yes, that's what we mean by fact. Yes. Sorry, yeah. I should have clarified that earlier. Okay. So now if we're looking for the number of factors of two. I want you to look at all of the I sub Ks that we've wrote. And I just want you to think about anything that might jump out as oh, that's kind of interesting. I wonder if there's anything to that. What do you think it is I'm thinking of? I don't want to say. I want to see if you can perceive it. It can be something that you have no idea that, that can't possibly play a role because we can't do anything with that. That's fine. You might dismiss it in your head. Just any simple, nothing complicated, simple observations about the I sub Ks that we wrote down. The, whatever the I, what, the I sub whatever we do, it uh, so far it seems to follow the pattern of it's going to be, we're going to find two more factors of two than whatever the I sub number is. That seems to be that. Yeah, that's good. Actually, I like that. Again, that one won't play out forever, obviously, because these have a max value of somewhere between 6 and 10 inclusive. Anything from the numbers themselves. The I sub Ks, not the N sub Ks. Well, what's your question? I want you to analyze the I sub K values written in these this stack right here. I, and I want you to tell me anything in there that connects to the actual question they're asking, which is something about the number of factors of two. Anything you can think of that connects those two ideas. I don't know. This came kind of, I mean, this kind of makes me think of the 2048 game, but uh, factors are kind of different in that. Um. Yeah, I mean, it does. Why does it make you think of that, though? Because 1,024 is one of the factors. That's good. Uh, 2 to the 10th is 1,024. Yeah. Um, anything else? You can look at those values and identify something. All of them are divisible by 2. For sure, because it's an even number, right? Yeah. Something else. Just something really... None of them are, di none of them are divisible by 3. Okay. Um, yeah, that would be correct because the sum of the digits is always 11. I like that. That's a good one. Um, something that connects to powers of two. Uh. Don't overthink it. Just really basic. I, I would bet a fifth grader could tell us this answer, for instance, a, a fifth grader who studied. Don't worry about if it's going to help us. Just really simple recognition of a connection. Because I know your brain has seen it and you just don't realize you've seen it because you probably already dismissed it. Give you 30 seconds. Just in the essence of time. Each one has something in common. You've recognized that they're not. And 64. 
Oh, why is that? How does that connect to factors of two? Because two to the power of six is 64. Interesting. Wait, that, that's important. Why would it not be? How could it be that that's the thread that's going to unravel the ball of yarn? Oh. Yeah, I didn't think that was important information. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. You noticed it with your brain, but your brain immediately dismissed it. And that's normal. Everyone does that. That's how I knew to keep giving you more time because I knew at some point you're just going to say, because I'm waiting so long, what you saw. And you're like, oh, but that's not going to help. So, But you have to work your brain past that point of that's not going to help and stop and ask. How could the fact that that 64 help? What, here's a better question. Why is it always 64? Why would they write? It's just two random numbers. If it was two random numbers, but they're also acting asking for factors of two, is that really how the test makers think? We'll just pick two random numbers and it won't impact the answer. No, they had a specific purpose for those numbers. So I, what we don't like about it is why. Here's why you think it's not good. What is the reason? Because it's attached to the other number. It's part of 1,064. How does that help us? If it's attached, we can't. There's nothing you can do with that. Mm -hmm. It's too bad there's nothing in math that would allow us to make it not part of the 1,064. Uh, that's a not a rhetorical statement. I want you to think about what I'm hinting at. Is there something in math that would allow us to move that apart from it in some way? 1,000 plus 64. Oh, and once your eyes alight on that. Uh, it's like it's such a simple thing. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't think of that in the test because I'm expecting the hardest thing they can throw at me. Yes. You know where you can get that insight? Intro to number theory. Huh. Right. That's exactly what you're going through now in the other text. So, you know, those kinds of concepts, you might think about it differently once you've completed that text fully. So now, why does this help? What is the thousand? What is 10,000? Aren't they powers of 10? Aren't all powers of 10, powers of two and five identical? For instance, 10 to the third and the essence of time, I'm going quick now. So we got a few minutes left of this class. Whatever this exponent is, so are both of these, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now uh, think about this now. If 64 is the sixth power of two, if we have not, the best guess I'm going to give it right now is that we want 2 to the 6 times 5 to the 6th here. Why would I want that? Because I can factor out 2 to the 6th. So now if I factor out 2 to the 6th, what happens in the other ones? Go to the 1064 and see what happens. You have 2 to the 3rd, 5 to the 3rd, plus 2 to the 6th. Notice you can only factor out 2 to the 3rd, and you have 5 to the 3rd plus 2 to the 3rd when you're done. What kind mm -hmm. of number is 5 to the 3rd? Simply stated. 625. No, no, no. Simply stated. It's 125, by the way. It's, 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 my bad. That's fine. It's odd, right? Yeah. And when I say simply stated, I mean the most basic level you can get. What's an odd plus an even every time? It's always an odd. Do you ever get any more powers of two out of an odd? No. No. Then what would be better is if we didn't have both an odd and an even. And if I took all of these powers of two out, I would then have an odd plus an odd which would be even. And we could get possibly one or more, well, definitely one, but possibly two or more powers out. So that's why I targeted two to the sixth for removal. So if I do that, what's left is five to the sixth plus one. Notice we really don't care about the K value, okay? We're focusing on what the N value is as the final answer. So now you could do this. It's 125 squared plus one. How do you square 125? You do 12 times 13 and you add a 25. 12 times 13 is 12 times 12 with another 12. It's 144 plus 12, it's 156 with the 25. And then you're going to add one. So it's 156 to six. Okay, uh, so 15,626. If you wanted right now, you could just divide this by two until you can't and be done. And it's really not that hard. And there's other ways to reason through this. I, I believe that five to the N plus one will only ever have one factor of two. And I think you can prove it with number theory, but we don't have time in this class today. So I'm just gonna show you the most basic level of finishing the problem. 
If you cut this in half, it's 7,500 for the 15,000 plus 313, right? 626 cut in half, this is clearly an odd number. And since it's an odd number, there'll be no more factors of two, but we did get one more out of it. So we got six factors of two here plus one more. The final answer is probably gonna be seven. One more thing that you should confirm is what happens if you go larger than six. Let's say I made it two to the seventh times five to the seventh, but you can never change that two to the sixth. So you can still only factor out two to the sixth. What happens to the numbers inside? You have a factor of two left on the left number and a one on the right number. A factor of two means it's even. The one makes it odd. Even plus odd will be odd. You only got six factors of two this way. And that's also why this number six is here. So people might just stop at, oh, I can factor out two to the six, it's probably six. And they don't think about the fact that now with the odd plus the odd, there's an even. That's why that trap answer is there. We can definitively say that going above does not give more, it gives less. I Meaning going above the K value of six. Okay, actually, I'm not sure what the K value is. It's not six, it's actually two less than that, it's four. The K value of four would have done it. All right. Okay, 